Well, welcome everybody to our, um, I don't even know what Ollie presentation we're on now for the symphony. This has just been such a success, but um, welcome to our tour of the orchestra presentation today. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer Kirby. She is our English horn player in the woodwind section of the symphony. And um, she has a particular interest in ancient music. And uh, when I was asking her what she might like to present, she immediately suggested ancient Western music. And I thought this is going to be such a cool topic. I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kirby. Thank you so much, Sammy, and thank you to everyone joining. I'm really excited to see you, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but you know, we're making it work over here. So we're going to talk about ancient Western music. And so um, I'm going to go through some different things here. We're going to talk about how do we even study ancient music. It was so long ago. We're talking three, four, five thousand years ago. Uh, we're going to go through uh, some of the music in Mesopotamia and Sumer, and we're, we'll, we'll work our way through to Egypt and then to ancient Greek. And with all of these, we're going to talk about how the music functioned in society. We're going to talk about some of the instruments and we're going to look at examples from art and literature on music and instruments as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about Greek music theory and how that relates to the music that we play today. And the last thing that's really exciting is that we will get to hear some surviving musical examples and some reconstructions of instruments. So with ancient music, we have a lot of problems and a few solutions. So one of the problems is that at this time period, a lot of the traditions are very separate. So if you think about rulers and sort of little pods of empires, they're not really talking to each other. They're not exchanging information like we do today. So there's not a really clear lineage of, you know, this music started here maybe with voice and then it progressed to this region so it's kind of piecemeal as we go through and look at the different uh, locations although you will see some similarities in instruments and some other musical um, type of similarities as we look at the different locations unfortunately we're never going to know what this music actually sounded like we have vocal works, but we're not sure how they use their voice. You can use your voice in lots of different ways, lots of different timbres. We have surviving instruments, but even if you reconstruct them, do you have the same materials? Are you playing them the exact same way? So um, the unfortunate news is we'll never know, but we're gonna try to get as close as we can to recreating some of this music. Um, but we have solutions for these. So the majority of our solutions come through iconographic representations. So this is what we think of as that's in art museums today. We have Greek pottery, we've got cuneiform tablets, we have statues, we have wall paintings, lots of different visual representation of what life was like and how they used music. So we're going to talk about a lot of those as we go through. Um, we're going to talk about some archaeological instrument fragments, so fragments of instruments that have actually been found, as well as a couple of intact instruments. Uh, we know about tablets and papyri, so papyrus as um, a form of reed and in especially ancient Egypt and Greece, they used it to make paper, basically, and so we've got lots of scrolls um, on how do you tune your lyre? How do you make a reed for this instrument? How does the scale of a piece of music work? And then actual pieces of music. So we've got a variety of little fragments of those type of works. We also have literary references. Um, we're talking about everything from philosophical writings such as Plato's Republic and um, Aristotle's Laws of Nature. And then we're going into things such as Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey, which also reference music. And the biggest solution that we have to this problem of ancient music is that 
we really have a desire to understand and preserve this music. There's something that really grabs us about this fascination with ancient music, especially um, ancient Greece. And that's evident today in that Sammy told me this is one of the largest um, one's the largest lectures that people have signed up for in a while so you guys are interested in it and that sort of goes throughout history people were very interested all throughout history and even today in this type of music so we're going to start all the way back in mesopotamia with the excavation that happened in the mesopotamian city of ur and this is where southern iraq is now and the excavation found a city that was from about 2600 before common era bce so when they excavated this city they found um you know what we think of when we think of the ancient uh, egyptian tomb so they had um, graves for monarchs or other rulers wealthy people and you know they would be buried with their greatest finery be buried with gold and jewels and um, musical instruments. So one interesting thing about the excavation at Ur, and especially the tomb of Puabi, or also called Queen Shabab, is that they found a lot of people in her grave. So this is very interesting. They found people and they found oxes. And it turns out that it was a uh, a part of the ritual that her servants would voluntarily join her at her death. And so they actually died. Um, they found little cups by them, so they believe maybe some sort of poison, but they actually died and were buried together as the funerary procession to help her move into the afterlife. Well, what's neat about that is that leaves us basically with a little orchestra that was in her procession. So we've got full instruments and fragments of instruments. We have about 10 that are significant, um, in significant condition that they can be reconstructed. And so we know that at least at this time, music was really well established. If you've got basically a little orchestra of music, you know that there's a really good system in place. You know, it's um, some of the earliest instruments we found are bone flutes, which would likely be somebody kind of fiddling around on their flute. But this is really the, how we know that music was organized and sort of starting on that path to what we have today. So here's a reconstruction that was made in the 1930s when the tomb was actually found. So they took um, how they found the, the bodies and everyone arranged and they made a painting of this funerary procession. So what's really interesting here, and I've highlighted it, is we've got these two big triangular instruments. And these are bullheaded lyre. So here are these actual instruments, and they survive and you can see them in museums. So they found two of these really large bullheaded lyres, and you can see they're adorned with gold and lapis lazuli, you know, they're very uh, ornate instruments. We've got a big sound box here at the bottom, then that's going to help provide the resonance for the instrument. And then we have several strings that reach up to this crossbar here. And then these are pieces of reed that would have been stuck in after you round the thread. So basically, if you, if you wind the string, you can kind of move that reed up and down and it will slightly adjust the pitch. Think of it kind of like a tuning peg on a violin. You can just slightly adjust the pitch to tune the lyre. So we also found um, depictions of music. So there's here on the left, this is from a shell plaque and you can see that we have a bull's head Um, lyre here, a very, very large one. And it is being played by presumably a donkey, I believe. And so we've got our uh, 
animal musicians there. And then over here on the right side, we have an actual person playing this bull's headed lyre and you can see it has a lot of strings. I'm going to go ahead. I'm having an issue with my presentation on my side. So I apologize for the technical difficulty. Does it look okay on the screen there, Sammy? It looks okay to me. Is everybody else, can they see it okay in the room, Michelle? Okay, I'll go ahead and go back to presenting here. Slideshow. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So um, here we have a couple of other instruments. We have another smaller lyre, and this is called the silver lyre because it's made out of silver. And um, we sh show here a museum recreation of how the strings would have looked. So the strings don't survive. Obviously, they're pretty fragile. Um, so we do have this reconstruction of what that lyre would have looked like. And then over here on the right, we have the um, a piped instrument. So this is presumably a flute or a reed instrument. We're not really sure, but it's a pipe made out of silver with different holes. And there we are. Okay, so next we're going to move on to what are called the Hurrian songs. And so these were found in the city of Ugarit, which is in northern Syria today, and they were found around 1950. And these are dating back to 1400 BCE. They are the oldest significant piece of a melody in the world. So what they found in these songs is actually a musical collection of these cuneiform clay tablets. And so cuneiform, they're about the size of a smartphone. <laughs> and um, it's a clay tablet that was scribed with a piece of reed. And so we have about 29 fragments of these songs and one of them being very significant. The text is in Hurrian at the top, which at that time would have been dying out. Um, and then at the bottom is text in Akkadian that actually shows you how to tune your lyre to play this song. So since the Hurrian language was dying out, it's thought that this was a way to you know, preserve something before it was gone. And then I have there on the left, an actual figure of someone playing a lyre. This lyre, unlike we saw kind of the bull's head lyres because they're so large, people were playing them in front. And this one's playing more kind of to the side here. And this was actually found in the same location as these tablets. Okay, so here is the actual tablet that we have. And you can see here at the top that um, there is one text and then there's a double line. And underneath that, that would be the instructions for tuning the lyre. So this isn't really notation as we think of it. You basically got the text and then you've got, these are the notes. So it's kind of like saying, Here's a poem, and it's going to be in C major. So we don't really know what it's going to sound like. And there have been tons of people studying this. And every single recording or reconstruction you'll find sounds completely different. So I picked a more recent one that goes along the lines of what my teacher, Thomas Matheson, believed to be closer to 
um, what might be correct. And it's based on um, scales of that are kind of used today. So I am, unfortunately, due to my technical issue, I cannot get to that. So I apologize, please give me just one moment while I bring up that. I think I can see your mouse, is it just not behaving? <laughs> No, for for me, it's, yeah, for me, it's not happy at all. I'm going to stop share for a second and see if okay. Oh, there we go. That fixed it. It was like my mouse, like objects were running away from my mouse. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Aha! That, it looks fine to you the whole time, but this looks so much better to me. Okay, good. <laughs> Again, I apologize for those technical difficulties. So here is a rendition of the Korean hymn. <laughs> So that was the oldest piece, significant piece um, of music that's been found. So now we're going to move away from Mesopotamia and we're going to go over to Egypt. So in Egypt, we have lots of literary and iconographic examples. As you may well know, they love to paint those walls. So we've got lots of images of instruments and music making. So we know that music was used in the home, you know, just to play and entertain either your guests or for yourself. We know that it accompanied souls to the underworld. So if you're familiar with the Egyptian Book of the Dead, there are actually texts of songs in there as part of the ritual for the funerary process and escorting people to the underworld. It accompanied labor, work, making things less monotonous <laughs> when you're doing all of that hard work of building the pyramids. But unfortunately with Egypt, we have almost nothing in terms of music. We have no musical notation that's been found. We have no treatises. You know, nobody saying this is how you tune an instrument. This is how you play an instrument. This is how the music um, itself functioned. So everything that we know about this music is pretty much hypothetical. But we do have instruments and we have pictures. So we're going to go through some of the string instruments first. And this is a bow harp and this is from the Metropolitan Museum and we're looking here about uh, 2000 BCE. And then here's an image of a woman playing it. So she would be seated in this very awkward looking position. And then the harp would be up on a sort of a little pedestal so it could be placed on her shoulder and played. And we've got a variety of harps in Egypt. So here's another harp from the Metropolitan Museum. And this is an arched or shoulder harp. And so you can see here it's really large and it's got big long strings and over here on the left that's somebody actually playing that instrument so it is a shoulder harp um, and this harp is actually from a much later period than the bow harp that I just showed this is from the new kingdom era but we've got some other harps that were used we've got another much larger look at all those strings um, seated harp being played and then we've got this longer, um, bigger harp that kind of looks like what we think of as a harp today that was usually played standing. And so 
Here is a reconstruction of this Metropolitan Museum of Art arched harp uh, being played. So again, with the reconstructed instruments, we don't really know what the music sounded like, but we can pretty much guess what these instruments sounded like since we can play them. So let's move on to some percussion instruments. So the most important of the percussion instruments was called the sistrum. And the sistrum was used in religious ceremonies and it was used to um, alert you that you were in the presence of the gods. And it's thought that it mimicked the sound of the papyrus stalks shaking. And that harkens back to the legend of Horus and how he was abandoned and raised amongst the papyrus. So you're often going to see this instrument with uh, priestesses, oracles, those sorts of people. So here we have a very ornate priestess with her sistrum. And then here is a sistrum again from the Metropolitan Museum. And you can see they're very elaborate instruments. And then we've got some other percussion instruments. So we have the clappers, which I just love. And because all of the clappers that have been found are in the shape of hands. So they would have sounded something like maybe a slapstick, but they were usually made of varying materials, wood, ivory, but it looks like two hands that you clap together. And then we've got a uh, tambourine. So this is an example. This is a pretty late period, the Ptolemaic period, but we've got a statue of someone playing a tambourine. And then over here we have a relief and we've got musicians playing tambourines and then we've got them playing some little clacker like instrument. So trumpets, wind instruments, right? Um, really exciting find was that trumpets were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. Everybody knows the tomb of Tutankhamun. <laughs> so this is around 1323 BCE. They are the oldest operational trumpets that have been found. And usually they're depicted in scenes of battle. So um, if you've seen the trumpet lecture that was given, he talked about the long pipes that were usually played in the overtone series and with these kind of calls to battle. So it's really cool, really cool about these instruments is here they are. Um, so we have one that's made out of copper and one that's made out of silver. And in 1939, someone played them. So today we're like, oh my gosh, no, don't touch the 3000 year old trumpets. But in 1939, somebody put a mouthpiece in it and they played it on the BBC radio. So here is a recording of these trumpets. The trumpets of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, Lord of the Crown, King of the South and North, Son of Bread. <laughs> There's a really interesting story because there is the belief of the curse of Tutankhamun. And shortly after this was broadcast, Britain was brought into the war. So people were then scared to study them or play them because they thought that they actually brought about war because that was part of the curse of Tutankhamun. Oh, quick question. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think of trumpets and, and the finger pieces kind of changing the sound. So there's no finger pieces that we're seeing with those instruments. So were there, is there any kind of holes or was that all just done by mouth? How was that, how, how did that change in, in note happen? Yeah, so that's all done with the lips and the lip pressure. And again, Jay, I think talked about this in his trumpet video. Um, so it's based on the overtone series. And so basically, you know, the tighter, I don't play a brass instrument, so forgive me. <laughs> the, you know, the tighter your embouchure, then the higher pitches you're going to get. And so that's why it's, he was mostly playing, you know, big high intervals, even though the tube looks long. And that's how the overtone series works. But yeah, it's just a single metal tube with no finger holes. Great, thank you. Yeah. So now we have a double piped reed instrument. My territory, right? So um, you'll often see them being played kind of sideways. And so here we can see that coming from her mouth are these two long pipes. It's often mistakenly referred to as a flute um, because they thought it was a flute instrument for a long time, but all of these instruments that I'm going to talk about with the double pipes are reeded instruments. So it was a double piped instrument and it had either a double or a single reed. We're not sure which. And so a lot of the reconstructions and a lot of the thought is built on that it might be a relative of an instrument that's still played in Egypt called the argul. And, um, you know, people who play in that tradition say that it's the tradition of the ancient instrument and they look a lot alike. So here is a familiar image if you went to the Terre Haute website. <laughs> um, and we have again a woman and she's playing here you can see what would probably be the reeds in a lighter color coming out of her mouth and we have the two pipes coming down. And what's really awesome is at the LA County Museum we have some pipes. So we have this actual instrument. And as you can see here, we have three pipes. So usually um, this also happens in say like Native American flutes that one specific instrument is tuned to a specific scale. So you can think like, these are my D major pipes and these are my C major pipes and these are my E minor pipes. Um, so it's likely that they would have had a bunch of pipes to play different pieces. So you can see here that these are in really good condition. Awesome. Love it. And then we have here the modern agul, which looks really similar. It's got the same kind of taper, the same kind of finger holes. The pipes are joined together. And the modern agul is a single reed instrument. And it's really interesting how they create that single reed and i'm not sure if you can see it too well here but basically you're going to take your round tube of cane and you're going to create a little notch in it to create a little tongue that's going to flap out and then you scrape it and it then it functions kind of like a clarinet reed up against the um hole of that tube so here is to kind of let you see and because it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around okay so he's got two pipes and he's got two reeds in his mouth <laughs> so here's somebody playing the modern argul so you can kind of get a feel for how this instrument might have been played and might have sound <laughs> double piped our goal. And Jenny, was he circular breathing? Yes. 
So these instruments are traditionally played circular with circular breathing. Okay, so that was so that's been a long tradition. It's not something that uh, so that's something they used to do then. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and we do know that from when we get to the ancient Greek instruments, we do know that that's how they were played. So unfortunately, it's time to leave Egypt. I could talk for hours and hours on all of this music, but I got to keep myself going through. So we're going to go straight on over to ancient Greece. And so the role of music in ancient Greece was really important. It was really a core um, sort of value that they held. So music was seen as an art and a science. So people played it for, you know, sort of the creative process, but they also studied it in a very scientific way, philosophically, um, dividing it down into mathematical principles. So music was really integral. It was present in all aspects of their life. People played music while they worked. It was used as entertainment at symposiums and symposiums were sort of these large intellectual parties. And a lot of times somebody would play a lyre and they would sing a song and make up a story and then they'd pass it on to the next person and the next person would continue the story. So we kind of had games like that still today. Um, it also, was in school, you were taught it. It was in religious ceremonies. People played it in their own homes for their own entertainment. Um, there were virtuosic competitions of music. And then we have plays and poetry readings and then even philosophical discussions. So the Greeks, not only did they love to study music and they loved to play it, but they really believed that it had the power to influence your character and your behavior. So part of music, as they defined it, was called mellows. And we've got two different types of mellows. So we've got our simple mellows. So this is a single instrument playing or a single song. You know, it's a very, very simple type of what we would think of as music. But then they called something perfect mellows. And to them, this is what would really heighten your emotions and affect your character. And that was comprised of pitch, rhythm, text, and gestural dance movements. So all of these things together. So how did the Greeks study music? Well, it was transmitted orally through apprenticeship. So you would be an apprentice with someone, say, I would like to play the lyre, and then you would study the lyre with the person. You would learn your songs, directly from the person. Few pieces would have ever been written down. Um, and so the surviving examples that we do have were likely written down long after they had been composed. You know, somebody said, I don't hear people playing this tune anymore. I'm gonna write it down so it doesn't get forgotten. So um, that's sort of why we have what we have. Um, so instruction on the lyre was part of your basic school education for everybody. You went to school, you studied math, you went to the gymnasium, and you learned the lyre. So let's talk a little bit about the lyre because I've mentioned it many times. So we're going to talk about some string instruments. We're going to talk about lyres, psaltery, and some lutes. So lyres are free resonating instruments that were strummed, and they were used to largely to accompany singers. Whereas the psalteries are plucked by the fingers and they're used more to play melodies or kind of like solo instruments. So we have the lyre over here. It's a small seven stringed instrument that is plucked with a plectrum. So that would be um, usually made of ivory or wood, kind of a piece probably about that big that you would use to either pluck or strum the strings. The lyre was synonymous with Apollo and Hermes, and so Apollo's the god of the sun. He's the god of, you know, reason and all things warm and uh, you know, knowledge and those types of those types of things we think of when we think of the lyre. So there was a band that was attached to the right arm of the instrument, and it curved around, and then it was held on the left wrist. So then your right hand was using the plectrum. And here you can see 
her left hand behind the instrument and then her right hand is down. So let's, uh, we'll see a few more examples of those as we go through into the specific lyres. So there are different types of lyres. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Forminx. And this is the one that would have been used at the time of Homer. And it has a small sound box, which is typically curved or in a heart shape here. And then it's either rounded or flat at the bottom. And then it has these kind of short, stocky little arms that come up with the crossbar. And then we've got our strings there. And then the, one of the most common of the lyres is called the chelis lyre. And chelis is just the Greek word for tortoise. <laughs> so these were constructed of a tortoise shell with ox hide on the front to create the resonating sound box. It has two um, fairly long arms that came up with a crossbar over the top. It again has seven strings, and this would have been the one that people would have likely learned when they went to school. They would have likely learned on the cello lyre. It was used for accompanying singing and private music making. And so here we have some more examples. So here's the back of the lyre. So I mentioned that there is this wrap here that goes from the right arm of the instrument around her left arm. So that way she is holding the instrument and she can use it kind of like a modern string instrument today. If you think of a violin, if you put down a finger, you are shortening the string and thus raising the pitch, creating a new pitch. Well, that's what they would be able to do on the back side of the lyre to create lots of different pitches and then using the right hand, they would actually strum or individually pluck those strings. Here we have an example of a teacher and his apprentice and it's really neat because we get to see the front and the back of the lyre. So here you can see the front and he has his hand out here and you probably can't see that itty bitty little plectrum there. And then we have the student and you can see um, the back side of his hand there pressed against the strings. And then something interesting up here is that we do have a forminx up here. So we've got that kind of rounded body and the short little arms. So here is a reconstruction of the cellis wire. So moving right along, I gotta get zoom in here. Again, I could talk all day about these. This is the barbatos or the barbaton, and it's a lot like the celli slider, but it has these big long arms that curve inward here. It was associated with Dionysus, and Dionysus, or you might know him by his Roman name, Bacchus, is our god of wine, revelry, and a good time. So this is quite a bit different than our traditional lyre that we think of with Apollo. It's believed to have originated in Lesbos with Sappho and Alcaeus, and that is a picture of them right there. And it's so it's often seen in symposiums, usually in erotic settings or dancing kind of scenes. So here is a reconstruction of the Barbatos. So now we're on to the kithara. The kithara is the largest lyre and it is a concert instrument. 
So it was played for these big musical contests that people would have. It was played in the theater and for festivals. So you can see our friend here, he is singing away, playing his kithara. So he's likely a performer at one of these contests. It had a very large square box with a flat bottom and then it has short arms as well. And it's often seen um, somebody's holding it standing and then they have this sash that wraps around their wrist. So we can see that a little bit here. I've got kind of a better picture, but we can see the sash here and that is actually going around his left hand that's behind here. And then here we can really clearly see his plectrum and the shape of that. So here we can more clearly see that wrap that goes around the instrument and then around the left hand to help support it. And then here's a really interesting statue that we have that exists that has a woman playing the kithara. So here is a reconstruction. <laughs> So because of its size and its more significant construction, you can tell that it is able to do a lot more things that you would think of as like a big virtuosic kind of instrument. So the last couple of instruments that you've shown us are all kind of, again, are string. So, you know, that kind of thing. So what would be their present day equivalent? So would it be more like a harp or... Uh it would be it would be kind of a combination of a harp and a lute because harps you know you pluck with your fingers and you kind of strung them and and that's what i'm going to talk about here with the psalteries oh, great. um whereas lutes you know you do have more of that strumming so it's kind of in between and i mean there are still people that play lyres and there are still lyre like instruments around um especially like in africa i was thinking india some oh. of the, the the sound that i heard made me think indian indian music but yeah okay great thank you yeah so now we're going to talk about the psaltery and so these are plucked with the strings so like the harp or if you think of zithers or dulcimers, the kind of flat lap harp type instruments where you're going to pluck out more of a melody as opposed to those strumming accompaniments. They were largely played by women in the home. And I have two examples here. We have a smaller one called the trigonon. And then we have the epic one called the epignon. <laughs> um, and it is actually the largest ancient instrument. So you can tell here it's huge. It's got tons of strings. And then we do have some lutes that appear in ancient Greece, but they don't appear until later when Alexander the Great comes in. So it's likely that he brought them the lutes with him and then introduced them. So now I could give an entire one of these lectures on my favorite instrument, the olives which is the predecessor to the oboe. So this is the most important of the wind instruments. We did have trumpets and some flutes, but those were largely battle or just kind of you played them at home. The alos is a double piped reed instrument and it's played with a double reed. And this one we do know for sure because there is a treatise on how to make a reed. It was made of wood, bone, metal, or ivory, and it had four or more holes. And like I mentioned with the ancient Egyptian instrument, each was tuned to a specific scale. So you had your C major pipes, your E flat minor pipes, that would be a crazy scale, but you get the point. 
<laughs> um, it was believed that they were discovered by Marcius in Phrygia or Athena. So there's a great story that Athena picked up this instrument thinking it was so beautiful and she played it and it made her face look so ugly that she threw it down. And as an oboe player, I identify with that. <laughs> um, it was played with chorus, it was played for entertainment and it was played in these big solo competitions. It is the instrument of Dionysus. So our good friend, the God of wine and a good time. So at these competitions, usually you would have singers, you would have kithara, and you would have olives competing for these grand prizes. There's a story that's really interesting about a piece called the Pythic Nomos, and it's sort of like a review of this competition, and it talks elaborately how his composition went on for hours, and it had five sections, and it was the epic of Apollo defeating the serpent. And so these are really big competitions. So here we have the olives. So we can see here that we've got our double pipe instrument and we've got the reeds coming out of her mouth here. We have in both of these pictures a bag that is made of some type of animal skin and we see that a lot. And it is the bag that they're olives would be in and they would have their multiple pipes in. In this picture, since it's not in her mouth, we can clearly see that there is a reed at the top there. And then here is another in, um, another Alit, as they were called, and he has this leather strap around his face and that was called a forbea. And so if you think about putting two reeds in your mouth, you have a space in the middle. So a lot of times you'll see players with this leather strap to help with the embouchure and the pressure that that creates. What's really interesting about this pottery is there is some wording on the side and it says, um, I forget the gentleman's name, but it says, so-and-so did this. So it's likely that this was his prize for winning the competition. You did it. And then the one on the right, I apologize, it's not the best picture. It's my favorite picture. I identify with it as an oboist. And there are a few examples of Alit standing there fiddling with their reeds. <laughs> and we have Aloy. We have lots of them actually compared to other instruments. There are no surviving lyres from ancient Greece, but we have Alos. And so there's um, an instrument that we have here that's in the Louvre Museum, and it's the best intact instrument that we have. So you can see here, obviously, the reed would have disintegrated, but you can see where the reed would have gone in the well. And then we have another pair here from the museum in Thessaloniki, and these are made of ivory. So here is a playing on an exact copy of the Louvre instrument. me otherwise. Uh, so moving right along, we've got the syrinx, which is a pan pipe. And if you're familiar with the story of Pan and his love syrinx, who was turned into reeds, um, it's just another instrument that we have. And here is a statue of a shepherd with his pan pipes. Then we have um, some percussion instruments, and one of them is called the crotula, and these were hollowed blocks. Here's a modern reconstruction, so you can see it a little bit better. And they were played in with one in each hand, and so they're making, you know, sort of the percussive sounds. And here we have a woman playing them, and then we have uh, 
gentleman playing the hollow stair with his orbea for homage or support. So we have an evolution of style. When we're talking about ancient Greece, we are talking about a long period of time. So the earliest music that we know of was performed with a solo singer and chorus and with or without instrumental accompaniment. We see examples of these in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. And we know that Greek literature was sung, danced, and accompanied by music. So Homer's Iliad and Odyssey would have been performed. And I have a recreation of what one of those performances might have sounded like. There's my mouse. So that was books, a little bit of book six of Homer's The Iliad. So as we sort of move along, more instrumental music starts to be established. And we actually see this kind of echoed in the medieval and Renaissance period, where we have choral music, and then we kind of have instrumentalists creeping up and saying, hey, we're cool too. So with the instrumentalists came a new style that was focused on virtuosity, improvisation, innovation. We've got these big competitions, you know, so really, playing their lavish instrument in these lavish hour-long pieces. So Greek music is monophonic. It's built of a single melodic line. So unlike how we think of today's music as having chords um, that go along with it, we've got in Greek music a simple melodic line. But we have instruments that can punctuate, uh, do or duplicate those melodic lines. Um, they could play maybe a consonant interval underneath. We've heard a little bit of that. Um, the rhythm of vocal works followed the poetic meters. So if you remember all the way back to English class, you have you know didactic, iambic contameter, all of those different poetic meters. And so the rhythm of what you sang would have followed the rhythm of the poetry. Greek music was organized by modes. Um, they were also called tonoi or octave species, and they were built on a tetrachord. And so a tetrachord is the interval of a fourth filled with four notes. So over there on the left-hand side of the screen, I've got an example of what our modern scale looks like, and you can see the division of the tetrachords into fourths. So we've got, you know, the one-fourth octave, and then we've got the other fourth tetrachord, and then we've got the one note at the top to make it that nice octave scale that we have today. So the modes were associated with regions, and they were also associated with different emotions. So a lot of what we know about ancient Greek music and a lot of what people study is music theory. So this music theory came a lot later. The treatises that were published are almost, almost some of them a thousand years after the music would have actually been played. And so our good friend Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? Um, he's not only studied mathematics, but also music, and he is believed to have discovered the ratios of intervals using a single string. So if you take a single string, you divide it in half, that new string is going to play an octave higher, and that's a two to one ratio. So he built kind of this basic of the mathematics behind music. And so music was then built on those types of intervals from the ratios. They really believed a lot in music of the spheres, so you'll hear that term thrown around a lot. Um, and that is 
sort of the idea that the universe itself has its own resonant music. And Plato wrote a lot about this, about how your soul is a reflection of all of these great harmonies within the universe. So when somebody plays, say, consonant or pleasant music, it resonates within your soul. Um, so it, there's a lot of these deep philosophical thoughts around the theory of this time. So with the few minutes we have left, let's hear some music. <laughs> so we have the Stasimon chorus from Euripides Orestes. So Orestes was a tragedy, so a drama, a play that was produced in 408 BC. It had large choruses of typically about 15 singers and it had dancers and they were accompanied by an orchestra. So in this surviving fragment that we have, the opening words are Kotala Firomai, which is a lament and it means I weep. So we've got a lot of dissonant, um, really odd sounding intervals to our ears that are really interesting. And over here to the left, we do have the surviving papyrus piece that we have here. And my computer decided to hate me again. So one second. Now I know how to fix it. There we go. So we have what this piece looks like if you know you take apart all of the little papyri bits. We have the line of text here and then above it, these are the notes. So they had a um, system of notation that was based on what I mentioned were the modes and each note had its own name. Unfortunately, they were not like our system, which is A, B, C, D, E. They were names like Meze, Hyperhypate, Proslamba Nomenos. <laughs> Throwing Greek words at you here. Um, but so we know based on the poetry that we can deduce the rhythm of the piece. And then we have our notes here, which are telling us which notes within a specific mode those pitches would have been. So here is our actual modernization of that piece. And here is what it sounds like. <laughs> So that is the fragment that we have from Euripides Orestes. So moving on, we have the Delphic pain. I'm gonna try this, it's a tongue twister, by Athenios Athenu. And this was composed for a specific festival that was honoring the goddess Athena. And it's from about uh, 138 to 128 BCE. It survives on two marble slabs that you can see on the sacred rock of Delphi. It praises Apollo. It mentions that these festivals had swarms of artists and you could hear the shimmering tones of the olives and the sweet voiced kithara. Um, and the composer was actually listed as a director of the festival um, in 128 BCE. So that's why we sort of have that range. We're not sure if that was the festival or if it was the previous festival. So here is what this actual tablet looks like. So it's a big marble column and it's really hard to see, unfortunately, but if we pick kind of this middle line, it's a little bit easier. We have again the Greek text and then you can see we have the little symbols above it 
and that's going to be our actual musical notation. And then here we have the modernization of that notation. And here we have a performance on a reconstruction of the olives and sayers. So that was a little bit of the Delphic painting. So our last musical example before we wrap it up is the Epitaph of Saculos. This is a super famous one because it is the earliest complete composition that we have. It's engraved on a tombstone that was found in modern Turkey and you can see that here. And the date is unknown and it's a wide range of what people think um, that this would have been composed. And it's very short, though complete. Um, while you live, be happy, don't suffer anything at all. Life is short and time demand its toll. So here is again, um, a more clear image of what that looks like with the Greek and then with the notation above it and our modernization. just a quick note, this music has influenced everything that we do today. Um, in the medieval times, they took the idea of Greek modes and they translated it into what we call the church modes, but they got it wrong. They translated them backwards. <laughs> so if you think of the door, if you've ever heard of, say, the Dorian mode, it's actually the medieval one is different than the original one. Um, in the Baroque music, we have the ideas of the affects, that certain keys evoke certain emotions in people, that harkens back to the Greek. Today we make, we play on scales that are built out of tetrachords. We use intervals, we use consonant intervals, such as the perfect fourth that Pythagoras discovered. So this music was so influential and is basically the foundation of the Western music that we still play today. So we have, I think, a little bit of time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirby. Uh, Michelle, we'll go ahead and open it up if there are any questions from the audience. Jenny, I actually had one for you. Yeah. Um, one of the recordings that you had featured a lot of pitch bending. Do you find that that was a common practice? That one, we're not sure about how much of the pitch build, pitch bending would have been. The, um, I think you're talking about the Alos recording. Yeah. And, you know, the instrument, double reed instruments lend themselves really easily to bend pitches. So, you know, 
based on the mechanics of the instruments, it's likely that some pitches were bent, but you know, it's um, different people's interpretations of how the music. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So from the, the examples that we necessarily got today, um, you know, ancient Egypt, early Greece, a little bit of Roman because Greek and Roman so much tied together. Yeah. Um, and then how much that fed into the others, because all I was thinking about is, okay, you're, you're looking at traveling minstrels who are necessarily singing those songs and they're playing along with them. So a lot of what you just showed at the very end made me think of that medieval time specifically, you know, that's, that's where that tradition originally came from and, and moved through. Um, so any other kind of examples of the, the contest now those are completely brand new to me um so i mean is there any other kind of examples of, of things other than just the instruments because i can still hear those sounds and in other instruments um any other examples of, of things from that specific early ancient time um that kind of carried forward yeah um again a lot of it is the theoretical the way that the music is built um that really translates into today we do have some of these instruments still being played the example is the egyptian uh reeded in, re, double reed pipe the double pipe reeded instrument there we go <laughs> um there is an instrument just like the alos it's called the duduk and it's played in turkey still um, there are double piped instruments in other parts of the world as well. As I mentioned, Africa, they still play versions of the lyre. Um, I think some of them are made out of tortoiseshell still. So we have um, even those instruments where probably somebody um, found it or the tradition just slowly continued, you know, for thousands of years. If you have one person teaching an apprentice, they teach their children, they teach their children, and you sort of have this um, little bit of knowledge that gets passed along. We're just, as academics, we're not sure how much of that is um, a reflection of what the ancient practices would have been, you know, because sort of like playing a game of telephone. Right. Well, and, and I was thinking the exact same thing, like you just said, is that more than likely it was an apprentice kind of program of you know, once the instrument was built, then, you know, the next round of people would come in and apprentice with the master musician in order to, to gain the knowledge and, you know, serve at the Pharaoh or, or whoever. Um, what about drums? I mean, I, I, those have got to go back really far, right? Right. Yep. Yep. So drums, um, there was a little bit of drums in one of the examples that I shown the Orestes right. examples. Um, we don't, a lot of times they probably would have been um, what we think of when we hear a lot of like Celtic music, you know, you've got a melodic line and you've got the drum that beats a pattern along with it. So it's likely, you know, in the poetic pattern that the drums would have been used. And of course we found really early drums that are before the Mesopotamian era, which is sort of where I started. Um, that would have been used like, you know, to go into war or to communication of some sort, even. Yeah. yeah. Communication. Yep. Great. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? I, I could ask you questions all day long and I, I swear. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Sammy. So Jenny, on the last piece that you showed, I kind of noticed there was almost a form to it where it had some repeated patterns and it almost sounded like there was a cadence at the end of it, do you find that in this early music that uh, researchers start to see form in music? And are there any forms that were recognized very early that have kind of carried on into our tonal Western music? Yeah. So like I said, the last example is the earliest complete piece. So we have lots of fragments. So, you know, we're not sure of the perfect tonal structure, but the forms followed the poetry. So if you have a poetic form that's, um, you know, two lines that are iambic and one line that's um, bacchic, for example, then the form is going to follow that. And it's likely because they believed in this mellows concept that the text and the music were kind of one, one whole thing that then the pitches would have gone along 
with that and you would have had like a natural falling. Um, so they did have the modes and the modes, um, if you think of medieval, if you know medieval church modes, there's a note called the finalis that is sort of the um, central note and what we think of today as like, you know, do, re, mi, we think of the do, the first note um, that each mode has that kind of cadential type of central note to that piece. Um, so it, I think that it would be a uh, beginning of that kind of that cadential feeling of coming to an end and having a, yeah, okay. Well, I can't thank you enough. I have thoroughly enjoyed your class, your presentation today. I actually think you should do a class for me. <laughs> Even if I'm the only one that attends, I will ask you so many questions. I um, love it. <laughs> and, you know, the next time that I do an ancient Egyptian or an ancient Greek or a Mesopotamian class, I am so going to hit you up because I never cover the music because I know nothing about it. But I know about the instruments. I mean, I know they had them. I just can't tell you anything else. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, so please help me thank um, Jennifer for her, for her presentation today. And uh, I can't wait to, to have you do something else for us. And, and I'm looking forward to the fall semester, Sammy. We, we are slowly, and I'm not kidding you, slowly getting in registrations because the program guides are lost in the universe somewhere right now. <laughs> but uh, we, will, we will have uh, programs coming up for the symphony with Ollie in the fall. Um, a few of them on Wednesdays because they are actually going to highlight all the, the concerts that they're going to do in the fall. Um, and then we have other presentations that we're doing with the symphony, um, which ranges everywhere from little bitty concerts as far as like, you know, maybe three people um, doing programs to kind of like what we've, we've done for the last two sessions with the symphony now. So thank you all so much. And uh, I look forward to continuing in the fall. <laughs>